All right, adjustments. So I, in my notes, I like went through the whole adjustment procedure, which is really, I'm, you know, I'm very excited when I do my notes. I'm like, oh, this is gonna be great. I'm gonna teach them how to do this. But you know, the more I do it, the more I realize, no, I'm not. What I'm gonna do is just t throw a bunch of information at you that's gonna overload you. And then you're gonna be like, when you do have to do this, you're not gonna be like, oh, Kevin taught me all about this five years ago in class. I know exactly what to do. So I will just hit some of the highlights about adjusting these systems, which I've really kind of already done rather than piece by piece by piece. I uh, probably won't write notes about it. But as I said, where are the instructions for adjusting this system? In the manual. Which manual? The M0 manual. M0 manual. Continental used to do things, service bulletins, just like uh, Lycoming, but they went to the M0 manual, and now it's hard to find. You have to buy a subscription to it, which kind of stinks, and, and now you, it's very thick, and it's like you can't find anything. It used to be great. Just like, oh, that's a service bulletin uh, M74-6, and you just go right to it, but now it's like, I don't know. i got to refine it every time. So anyway, you're going to follow the instructions in that. And following the instructions in that, there are four adjustments. Two that you should not touch unless you have these gauges installed, and two that you can freely touch if you so desire. So in this particular system, they've put in a T right here, a T. So sometimes on these you will have fittings that are blocked off. Put out the other picture. Oh, that one had it. You'll have like one of these fittings maybe blocked off or T, I should say, teed and blocked off. So they'll actually, let me say it again, they'll put instead of an L right here, they can put a T fitting. So you can have two hoses, right? Mm -hmm. But you'll see one has a cap on it on the airplane. Well, what's that about? Why has it got a cap? That's where you hook the hose for adjusting the fuel system. So I tell you that to tell you that uh, one of the best live lectures I've ever done for IA Renewal was uh, this guy with the NTSB, and he's somewhat local around here, and uh, really enjoyed listening to this guy. I mean, he, just, he just shows up with slides of accidents and talks about them and what went wrong, and, and you just learned so much. I mean, I, just, I went home and just did all kinds of things different. Like, I remember one that really stuck out is they had a glider that crashed. And uh, I don't even remember why it crashed. The, the important point was uh, he made is that one person lived and one person died. And so he said, whenever you have a crash that is survivable by one, you want to know what happened to cause the other person to not. And what it was is the way the aircraft sat on the ramp. The back, we'll just, I'll make it part of it. The, the guy, the shoulder harnesses for the back seat were shaded by something. And the ones in the front sun rotted. So when they crashed, and you, you just yeah, the forward person went forward, it ripped the shoulder harnesses. And um, there's another seatbelt one. Um, somebody put in shoulder harnesses in a steerman, steerman biplane, where it normally had a lap belt. It didn't have shoulder harnesses. So they went around the back and bolted it to the seat. But the way when you crash and go forward, something happened. Yeah, you submarine. Yeah, so I was trying to think how that happened. But it, it pulls you down, and, and it broke the guy's back. Yeah, the four points aren't super good for that. Yeah, but it was so something how he had it in the seat, too, and how it folded the seat over when it did that. That's what it was, because the seats aren't really substantial in the back. They don't have a lot of structural integrity on the back, but there's no... They're just tin. They're lightweight tin. Just, you know, like this. So imagine if I... Cooper, go kick them. Yeah, the so if I attach <laughs> my, my seat belt right here to this large tin thing, and it's up here, when I go forward, just gonna buckle. it's going to buckle the whole thing. So it's going to put pressure here, buckles it, and so if you scrunch down, breaks your back. Um, but getting more to this point is, uh, I want to say, I mean, it's a picture of this this aircraft, and you know, it's uh, maybe a twin, I don't know, it must have been a single. And I think it had crashed in a cemetery, which was just creepy. But he's there doing the inspection, I mean, that, that lost, lost power, crashed, everybody died. And uh, as they're walking around the, uh, the accident site, you know those red plastic caps <clears throat> that go on hose, oh, yeah. hose fit? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. He picks one up out of the dirt. 
right underneath the fuel pump. So somebody done a fuel injection test run and put a, a plastic cap back on where the T fitting is. Oh, instead of an actual metal one. Yeah. And of course, there were several from hoses that weren't put on all the way. So anyway, so make sure you have to, you just have to be so careful. I just can't stress enough when you're dealing with hoses and fuel injection systems that everything has to be put on right. But I say it all the time. I hope you believe me. Uh, so anyway, so for this adjustment system, can you do idle speed and idle mixture without pressure gauges? Yes. Absolutely. It's not a big deal at all. So how do you adjust the idle speed? The stop screw. Stop screw right there. If you want it to go faster, just turn it in. Now, something I do need to address. When you guys are doing your orals, and I say, well, how do you adjust idle mixture? Okay, every single one of you seems to say, first, I'm going to back out the idle speed. Stop saying that. Because what it is, is I told you, when I am setting up a carburetor, I like to back out the idle speed and use so it doesn't hinder me. But if a customer brings in their airplane and I test run it and I pull out the idle mixture and I don't get a rise, I'm not going to walk out and undo the idle screw, the idle speed screw. Does everybody understand that? Yeah. It was idling absolutely fine but it didn't have a rise and fall on the mixture. So which screw do I have to adjust? Mixture screw. mixture screw. So to go out and start messing with the idle speed screw is ridiculous. Don't do that. It's idling fine. Now you just made more work for yourself and it made it sound like you didn't know what you're doing. So if somebody in my shop did that, I'm like, why, why are you making more work? Yeah, oh, well, I don't know, that's what you said. So, so don't do that. And now, yes, maybe once you adjust the mixture and you get it right, it's going to idle. idle a little faster. Well, then back the idle screw out of an uh, eighth of a turn or something. That don't make extra work. But anyway, so want it to go faster, screw that screw in a little bit, open up the butterfly. If it is not, if you need to adjust the idle mixture, it is that nut right there. You screw it in, screw it out. All right. Um, but as far as everything else goes, when you have to set up this fuel injection system, and when would you set up the fuel injection system? What would be the, the, the reasons why you would do it? Don't you think the factory did it when they test ran it? It's different for each engine. Well, don't you think they put it on the engine and test? These things come together. You're so upgrading to a fuel injection system. Oh. You have a problem with it existing fuel injection? So would you still do it on a new engine? Just came from Continental out of, the, out of the crate. They test ran it for two hours. When it comes to you, it comes with magnetos, starter, fuel injection system, spark plugs. I mean, it's there, it's a complete engine. So would you still do it? No, I wouldn't, I guess not. So I'm not taking my plane to you? All right. Yeah, you'd still do it. Uh, yeah, because you're installing it on the, on the airframe now. It's, a, it's, it's just still a little bit different because you have the different uh, fuel pumps. I mean, same fuel pump, but you just, it's a, you still do it. So, yes, so new engine, you are correct. It just made you feel bad about it, but you're right. So, yes, new engine, what else? What's that? Replacing it. Replacing? Okay, so yes, if you bought a whole new fuel injection system, I, I would venture to say, yes, that's a good one, good, yes. There you go, change a major component. What if I changed a uh, fuel nozzle? Maybe not. Probably not, well, that's up to you. What if I changed fuel pump? Yes. That'd be like the number one thing. How about a flow device, a manifold valve? Yes. It yeah, it wouldn't hurt. That's it's expensive, good. but you know, maybe, maybe, maybe that would be okay. I don't know, wouldn't hurt. Um, so. It takes about four hours, four to six hours. If you've never done it before, it can take eight. I spent like two solid days on a twin one time. It was a, like a damn near brand near new twin, but the guy was really, really fussy. And he liked to hold the handles like it, because you know, you have, it's a twin. And he, when he, wherever you put them, he wanted every dial on the instrument panel to match perfectly. So, and it was just not rigged that way. And so, 
Yeah. He paid a lot for that. He paid a lot for it. But it was a brand new twin, too. So, um, yeah, but I eventually did it. I mean, I had to adjust the fuel systems to get them perfect. Then I had to adjust all the handles to get them perfect. And it it took me a long time. But, yeah, if you're going to go out there, you got to decal it. You got to put these in there. It's going to take you, it takes two people because it's hard to get, you know, the way I did it, we set up the gauges. One person's outside. We can see the gauges. One person's running it. So you don't have to get in and out, in and out. Huh? I know. It's I like that. yeah, I do too. Oh, I had no problem with it. He paid the shop good money. I enjoyed it, and you know, it wasn't a problem with me. Um, I actually I did have a problem with it. It was right in the middle of summer. It's one of those when we had 110 degree days for days and days on end, and they insisted that we do it like right now. So I mean, I was out there just. I'm still dark from it. <laughs> and we're just baking this freaking engine. I'm like, this is not good for this engine. Because you, right? So you're going to start it up. You're going to idle it. You're going to warm it up. What does warmed up mean? Oil pressure. Yeah, it's really all you have. Because cylinder head temp is not like a car. It'll go up and down with power. So if you idle it long enough, if you... If you fly an airplane and you land and you're idling it, it's going to start working its way down. So, um, but oil temp is, is your best indicator. So, um, get your oil temp. Like I said, I don't take off on my airplane until I see hundred degrees. If you're running like a Rotax, um, Rotax is kind of cool. All the ones that I've ever run, they have a digital readout. Like I've showed you, like I have the JPI, but they have like Avidyne or something like that. The colors change. So it actually has, um, I forget what color it is, but it's really obvious when you're looking. It's not red, <clears throat> but when you're looking at your oil temp <coughs> and like tachometer, tachometer, I think it goes yellow at a very low, low range. Anything above that's yellow. So you know not to go into that range until the oil gets to, uh, it's, I think it's like 120 degrees maybe. And then once you reach a certain temperature, all the colors change and allow green arcs going to go all the way up to, so you just wait until the green changes. So it takes out all the guesswork out of it. Um, anyway, so we're going to warm it up. And then you're going to have your, you already have your two gauges installed, which means you got to tee into it, run hoses. You got to tape the hoses up. Um, you don't want to run an engine without a cowling. Why not? Because the cowling provides cooling. Yep. Without the cowling, it gets no cooling. The air just goes over the top of the cylinders. doesn't go down between, so you're baking cylinders. That's not good. So, all right. So best case scenario, you tape this all up and you get it and you run the hoses out of maybe an oil door or something like that and you're going to idle it and then um, you're going to put it at the exact RPM that that table shows you and you're going to adjust your metered fuel pressure. Like I said, this is easier to do this way than it is with that port test because the port test you got to get flow and pressure. It's a very tiny little parameter where the two will actually meet because if you adjust the pressure up just a little bit too much and the pressure is still within range, guess what your flow does? It goes out of range. So if you have just a pressure gauge, you have like a lot of room, but if you have to do pressure and flow, there's like one position where the two will actually be both in the green. I say in the green, they're not color coded, but you know, you know what I mean? What's the point of having the, like, what's, having, what's why you have the flow? Like, so that it's perfect. Yeah, you said it's like with this, you're just, oh, well, we just don't, it's I always use. Do, do I have honestly yeah. never done it this way. I always used a port test. In fact, when I was down at the shop the other day, and they were having problems with one of them. I said, "Well, you did run the." And they were having problems with fuel injection. I said, "Well, did you set it up for the manual?" Well, yeah, yeah. I said, "Use the port test." No. Well, why not? Well, it's not calibrated. The hoses are cracked. So fix it. So they just did it this way, and then it wasn't. Yeah, it just didn't. You know, not quite right. So anyway, port test is better, but. You know, you do what you do. So anyway, so you set up the low pressure. Which screw am I going to do for the low pressure? There you go. Right? So I'm going to get that one. Then you're going to run it up to the high power setting. They'll tell you where, which is, I think, usually right about red line. So I run it up to red line. Then you got to adjust the other one. So you're going to adjust the high end until you get what you want. And you back it down to idle, and you see if you screwed that up. And if you screwed that up, you change that. Then what do you do? Go back to the other one. Go back to the other one and fix that one. You go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Keep doing it over and over. Adjust a little bit, a little bit, a little bit, until it's absolutely perfect. Then once you get those two things done, what's next? 
Idle speed, idle mixture. <laughs> so you got to check your idle speed, idle mixture. How do you know if the idle mixture is right? Your RPM rise on idle cutoff. Same old thing. Same old, same old. So yeah, that's what you do. So that's the adjustments. Let me see. Um, oh yeah, I forgot. So let me see. <laughs> I just looked over notes. Then what comes next? Well, a lot of times when you're doing this, you also have to adjust the prop governor and the <laughs> adjust your prop governor. So I um, said so watch temps. Turbocharged systems. Uh, of course, I didn't mention this on this one, but these are not turbocharged nozzles because they don't have what? They don't have double yep. All right. I have like half a page of something that was fun for me to write, but it said, how much fuel and air are needed for an IO540? That's a six cylinder running at 2,500 RPM, air weighs this much, but volume, not weight, that, that, let me say 30 pounds per minute, seems like the ratio, 1,800 pounds per minute. Five, five I don't know. One thousand and twenty pounds of air per hour. Well, we knew that. that yeah. Yes. <laughs> I thought I wrote it somewhere where it's. Uh, Fifteen thousand cubic feet of air. Yeah. All right. Any questions on any of this stuff? Yeah, like that low pressure relief, high pressure. Oh, metering valves. What happened here? Hydro lock. From what? From too much gas. Over priming. Yeah, their sniffler tubes weren't working right. <laughs> That's true. That is true. Did you sniff your sniffles? Didn't sniff the sniffles.